it's important that as we develop and grow as, as human um, communities, that we really think carefully about all the little things that we do and how we, how we go about that development. That's Jessica Schultz, the manager of OceanWise's House Sound Research and Conservation Team. For more than 20 years, the team has been monitoring and collecting information about the health and wellness of House Sound. We're at the stage where we know what questions are important to start asking and where to start focusing our attention, which is really important. Um, it's an exciting time in House Sound right now because while there is a lot of threats from industrial and, and residential development, there's also a strong sense of stewardship in the area, lots of citizen science, lots of growing interest in learning how we can come together in, in different ways of government, governance to address these, these problems in a, in a way that brings everybody to the table. Um, and that's challenging, but I think we're, we're at, right at the precipice where uh, we have the opportunity to set an example of how, how we can manage this type of development. Ocean Watch recently released its report card on how sound. It covers what we know, where there continue to be gaps in our understanding, and what are the impacts of urban and industrial development on the fjord. For these reasons, we invited Andrew Day of the Coastal Ocean Research Institute to join us for a conversation that matters about how sound. Conversations That Matter is a partner program for the Centre for Dialogue at Simon Fraser University. The production of this program is made possible thanks to the support of the following and viewers like you. Andrew Day, welcome. Pleasure Thank to be here. How sound? We were out yesterday on one of your vessels, yes. the Rudy Ann, yeah. for a uh, very generous supporter of not only the aquarium, but also the Center for Dialogue at uh, Simon Fraser University. Yeah, fabulous guy. Extraordinary guy. Yeah. And he has a tremendous commitment to making sure that the world that we, this place that we call home, uh, remains habitable and sustainable. But, uh, you know, we were out in House Sound because you're focusing, or you've been researching House Sound for a number of decades now, but you just released your report on the health of House Sound. How are we doing there? Well, the, I mean, I think the general, the, the, the sound bite is <laughs> uh, showing signs of recovery, recovery. Yeah. Still lots of issues and a lot of unknowns. <laughs> <laughs> That's the soundbite. That's the soundbite. <laughs> Good thing that we're not in the soundbite business because I think that there's a lot more at work here than just that. Yeah. We've got uh, industrial development that's there. There's proposed industrial development. There's still the the cleanup of Britannia yeah, Beach. That's right, yeah. And then we've got encroaching urban development and greater marine use. That's right. How do all of these things start to affect the well-being of, you know, a precious little... A waterway ecosystem uh, that we, you know, affectionately know as how sound. Yeah, and well, that is the question mm -hmm. uh, of the millennium, and, and not just for how sound. I mean, we chose how sound because it's it's a, I think, exemplary of areas around the world that are close to urban centers, uh, have you know a, a, a lot of traffic, a lot of growth, a lot of uh, industrial impact but still have some wilderness values. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, you can go to areas of how sound and, you know, it's, it's incredible, right? It's, oh, yeah. it's beautiful, it's rich. It's, you wouldn't know that around the corner, <laughs> yeah. you know, millions of people. So, um, so that is the question. And, uh, I, you know, there's layers to that question in, term, in terms of how do we understand just the impact of one development? Mm -hmm. uh, how do we understand the impact of 15%, I don't know if you know this, 15% increase in population in, in Squamish, for instance, over the right. last five years. Um, but then, in addition to those, how do we look at the cumulative impact? When you add all those things together, mm -hmm. <laughs> what does that mean for right. salmon, eagles, whales, plankton, the, the little, you know, the yep. little creatures? The sea lions that we saw yesterday. The, you yeah. know, and, and the... And the I think the interesting thing, the reason we did this report was nobody's looking at that bigger picture. Mm -hmm. Every government agency has their jurisdiction, you know, municipalities have their areas, everyone's got their box that they're in. There's nobody responsible for what, you know, <laughs> how, how does this all 
fit together. So that's why we did the report. And, and so, and then what could be the overall strategy to ensure that we maintain the best possible health? That's right. And how do different people and organizations fit into that that uh, collective strategy? Because these, you know, these are clearly all issues and problems that come from multiple sources. Mm -hmm. They're only going to be solved by multiple sources. Yeah, for sure. You mentioned that the population of Squamish has increased dramatically. So has Whistler, which just is upriver. Yeah. Yeah. So it's contributing as well as uh, right. to, to input that goes down into the ocean. That's right. Uh, but then you go, you take a look along that entire uh, sea to sky, uh, you know, yeah. beautiful highway. There's far more homes along there than than you would know when you drive the highway. Uh, oh, that's right. What are the pressures that the, that that kind of urban development start to put on how sound? On what the are the ecosystem. things yeah. that they're starting to leach into the water? Yeah, so we, we have things that we know about, like uh, wastewater. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you drive your car, a little bit of oil leaks out, a little bit of gas, whatever, you know, that's all going into the stormwater system and it's all, you know, everything flows downstream, <laughs> right? <laughs> so there's, there's those kinds of pressures. There's, um, you know, people, you know, you dump some paint down the sink or you liquid drain or this or that. There's, you know, there's, there's chemicals mm -hmm. that are, that end up in the system. Prescription medicine. Um, that you go prescription along, medicine, that's yeah. right. We're yeah. all peeing out our, you yeah. know, estrogen or this or that. Um, you know, the list sort of goes on. Everything that goes down the drain, every time you flush your toilet, it's going somewhere, right? Mm -hmm. there's, there's, there's some treatment in some areas, some areas there's not. Uh, but that treatment doesn't necessarily take anything out. And we've got new uh, emerging threats like uh, plastics and microplastics. Yeah. So this is a, you know, you, this is the, the humans as rats in the cage sort of thing. <laughs> After yeah. a while you get, you know, they're choking on their own garbage. Well, uh, I just, just read a recent study, 83%, 83% of water uh, sampled in, in a number of countries around the world has microplastic particles in it. Drink, drinking water, water drinking. Yeah. In, in the U.S., that was 94.5% has microplastic particles. That, you know, want some water? <laughs> well, I, you know, so I try to drink out of glasses, and I try to, like, yeah. well, it was my sports bottle was made out of glass, not yeah. out of plastic. Um, you know, I, because I'm aware of the fact that, you know, it's not sitting there in a clump. It yeah. winds up being those microbeads. And I think this has probably been one of the most interesting sort of new understandings of what plastic in the water really is is all about. Yeah, and we, we could have a big, we could talk for 20 minutes about plastic alone. Mm -hmm. uh, but, um, yeah, there's large, uh, you know, chunks of plastic that get into fish and whales and stuff, and they choke and die. Mm -hmm. Plastic bags that turtles think are jellyfish and... You suffocate know, on. Suffocate and, yeah. on. There's uh, smaller microbeads which are put in cosmetics and those sorts of things. That's now been banned mm -hmm. uh, in Canada and is, is you know, being, being moved into place. And then there's microfibers which are every time you wash your clothes, that's going into the laundry. It's, it's little pieces tiny off, little yeah. fibers, right? Yeah. Or microplastics um, where you get the larger pieces breaking down into small bits. A mm -hmm. couple problems with that. One is um, they tend to carry contaminants and toxins and then transfer what, those. Did it adhere to them? And they then adhere to they them and then they, they, you know. Wow. So, so the point is, um, not to get all, oh my God. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but the point is, you know, humans have uh, an incredible amount of, of impact on their light is mm -hmm. another one, right? You, you really start messing with the natural cycles of birds and bees and other creatures that depend on light when uh, your lights are on all the time or fish when they can't mate, you know, the same triggers mm -hmm. if there's lights on the water all the time. Uh, noise is another one, you know. Anyway, there's, that's the, there. <laughs> but that goes down into the food chain. And it all goes, yeah. and then it comes back. And this, yeah. this is the point I think is, uh, is really interesting for, for people to realize is, I think we're, we're starting to realize, and there's a lot more environmental consciousness, we're starting to realize that humans have an impact on the environment. We, we keep developing, every time we develop, we're mm -hmm. adding to that. Um, what we're starting to see now is, just as the water cycle brings, you know, evaporation and clouds and <laughs> comes back, <laughs> we're starting to see, you know, we're eating fish, we're drinking water, we're, we benefit, we take uh, every second breath we take comes from the ocean. 
Uh, so what's every going second in breath. every second breath? Yeah. And so if we start choking the, the microorganisms that create that, mm -hmm. right, and in the same way if we chop down all the trees that are the lungs of the earth, we're not going to be able to breathe. <laughs> yeah. know, we're not, we're going to be drinking, uh, you know, what we think is pure water. It's carrying toxins. We're, the food we eat mm -hmm. you know, is going to be carrying things. And, you know, at a certain point where it's, where it's in water, you, you can't, like, clean. You're not going to be able to make everything in a lab that's totally clean. Right? Mm -hmm. So uh, we gotta we got to get, get with it and get uh, start getting organized about, about having a no, you know, really thinking about what we put in mm -hmm. and cleaning up what we've, what we've done. And when you say we, you mean yeah. each and every single one of us. It's not like we're pointing the finger at government or some major company. Yeah. And they all play a role, but so do we as individuals. Oh, yeah. 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 I think the days of, you know, the finger pointing are, yeah. are so far done. As, as I said, you know, th this is these are problems that are are so collective in nature now mm -hmm. uh, that um, it's going to take a, a collective effort to, to fix them. And and uh, certainly, there's you know, larger polluters. And governments have a mm -hmm. significant role over certain things. And yeah. uh, and you know, but as individuals, that's that's where change really. Um, gathers momentum, whether it's through changing habits or advocacy or, or um, conducting science, getting involved, whatever. Does how sound like the canary in the coal mine? Does it give us a sense of how well we're doing here on the coast of British Columbia? Yeah, I think, I, I think, I, I don't know if I'd say canary in the coal mine, because I think everywhere is the canary in the coal mine now. <laughs> okay. I think doing the report there was a way of illuminating much broader trends. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it's, as I said, we, we chose it because it's kind of uniquely positioned. It has elements of urban development and, and that, but it then also has some very remote, mm -hmm. rugged elements. And that's what the BC coast is, right? It's, right. it's uh, you know, some urban centers, but a lot of wild areas too. So one of the things that I'm interested in, because we had uh, about a year and a half ago, we had Brian Riddell from the Pacific Salmon Foundation yeah. in yeah. to talk about what was happening to Chinook and Coho in the Salish Sea, you mm -hmm. know, with his marine survival uh, right. project yeah. there. What do we know about uh, Chinook and Coho, uh, you know, health within House Sound? Sure. So um, one thing we did is we looked back. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we tried to understand status and trends of different things. And um, so we looked at history. We looked at, uh, you know, records and statistics. We also looked at news articles, all kinds of things. One thing that's, you know, I don't know if a lot of your, your, uh, your, your watchers will know, but, you know, there was a derby in Howe Sound, yes, there right? Was. Not yeah. the, the Vancouver, Vancouver Sun, Sun Derby. Yes, <laughs> Vancouver that's Sun right. Derby. Yeah. Not that long ago, a couple of decades ago, three to 4,000 boats out yeah. there. You know, two, three days. Like, I don't know how many fish you catch. <laughs> I mean, the, and the, the, they were big fish. And these are big fish. Yeah. And so um, we've seen the same trend. There's been, you know, there's been kind of a, a, a spike in like some pink salmon for a little bit. Overall, the numbers are low. It's mm -hmm. not just the low numbers that are concerned. It's the the the, the flesh size, the length, right. the size, the big ties. You know, we've lost that genetic pool mm -hmm. to a large degree, um, and w you know. The, I think there's there's still some great fishing opportunities and and all that sort of thing, yeah. but but we're really depleting the genetic makeup of that those stocks. You know, when I saw the number of sea lions that we uh, yeah. got to, uh, you know, they're enjoyable to watch as they're bathing in the sun and into, yeah. the, into the water and whatnot. I started thinking, well, hmm, it seems like that population in House Sound to me is growing, which would be an indication that there's a a greater sort of food source there mm -hmm. for them, but still is not what it was, um, you know, as you say, you go back 40, 50 years ago. Yeah, well, I mean, think about uh, the southern resident killer whales as an example. Yes. Right? They we're down to 79 individuals, uh, and, and that's, you know, Historically, they used to be shot as a nuisance. Right. And then they were. And you would see them in House Sound regularly. And you would see them in House. And, yeah. and there was a, a resident. This is, this is you know, uh, one of the things that I was amazed to find. And there was, there was a million things I was mm -hmm. amazed to learn about. Um, there was a resident uh, humpback whale population in, in Strait of Georgia and House Sound. Uh, you know, over 100 individuals. That, that population was wiped out essentially mm -hmm. in a year. There was two yeah. whaling things. So these Kate's family used to run 
whale watching trips out of uh, Prospect Point, mm -hmm. one of the first sort of whale, <laughs> whale yeah. watch expeditions, uh, and they tried to fight it, but you know, basically a whaling company came in and, and slaughtered um, those populations. So, you know, that's the kind of um, situation where, mm -hmm. the, what, was the, what was the ecosystem like? How much abundance of life would have had to be there to support that many whales? Right. And in what way were they creating the ecosystem when they were pooping, you know, they were, yeah. that's fertilizing the system, right? So, you know, we've, we've just really restructured what mm -hmm. was there, and uh, and so we're seeing the signs of recovery. Seeing yeah. some humpbacks come back, we're seeing, you know, we we got to keep going in that direction. Well, one of the interesting things that I noted was the impact that logging, especially in the formation of log booms, and mm -hmm. of course, uh, you know, when you have those sorting yards and collection areas, you get the bark that drops off, and it has a devastating impact on eelgrass. Sure, it just coats the bottom, basically. Yeah, yeah. and and the value of eelgrass is extraordinary. Like, how can you have a, uh, an abundant and robust salmon population if you don't have eelgrass? Yeah. I, Which seems I, like I, a, an odd sort of connection, but I, you know, when I, when I read that, I went, oh my gosh. Yeah, the, the, mm -hmm. um, I, I can't remember the exact number. It's something like 70, 80% of the species that are fished commercially in, in British Columbia that we enjoy are incredible seafood, yeah. uh, spend a significant portion of their life in eelgrass. So As they come out of the river from from when they or were, they come when, in, you know, black cod will come in yeah. from the depths and, and halibut and crabs, dungeness crabs, etc. I mean, eelgrass is like it is the nursery grounds. Mm -hmm. So you're not just wiping out a little bit of grass. <laughs> you're, mm -hmm. you're basically wiping out the production areas that um, that lead to the large populations of, of other species that we enjoy. Now, people would argue that the amount of logging activity in the area is down, and so therefore it's it's better. But the, uh, one, uh, one of the things yeah. I noted is that there's more and more like private docks along the shoreline, yeah. which have a similar kind of impact. Yeah, or, or people's anchors. I mean, mm -hmm. More people on those anchors, they throw their anchor down, they d it drags along, it's just chewing up the eograffs. Right. There's, there's lots of, of d the shade from the, the docks will, mm -hmm. will uh, prevent eelgrass from going or, or growing, or if there's um, pollutants in the water, it'll cause a disease on the eelgrass. Anyway, you know, yeah, lots, right. of, <laughs> lots of Britannia of mine, of, of course, has been yeah. there for a long time, and there, there's been remedial work going on there. How are we doing on sort of getting ahead of the contamination that was leaching out of that mine for so many years? And is it bringing yeah. some benefits at this point? Um, well, for sure. I mean, it, the, the, that was the most polluted, uh, you know, mine site in the world for yeah. a period of time, and uh, they've done put a huge, I mean, unbelievable amount of government resources and our, our public resources into mm -hmm. trying to fix it. Um, so, we're, what we found was still some mm -hmm. some leaching of, of metals from an unknown source, but you know, by and large. That's a, an, again a, a sign of of uh, recovery or of um, a, a huge improvement over what it was, which was you know yeah. devastating. Literally across the sound from there, mm. w there was wood fiber, uh, the pulp mill. That's right, which isn't there any yeah. longer, and so that must be also giving a little bit of relief to that that Absolutely area as well. Absolutely, same thing. You know, so we, we've stopped the the introduction of of different chemicals, and we're still seeing some of those chemicals in crabs. And so this is the you know I think this is the you know, the, the place we have to come to is, you know, life doesn't give you the opportunity to set the, press the reset button. Right. right? We've, we've wiped out the genetic material for that humpback whale population. We, you know, one thing your, your watchers would be interested to know is there used to be a, a million ulican uh, up in the Squamish River. So ulican are these candlefish, they, they're these, these small, very oily fish. Mm -hmm. So now you think about that, like, what is the economic value, let alone the cultural value and the social value and the ecological value? Because those, those fish are exactly what, you know, the most nutrient rich mm -hmm. kind of fish, high oil content for salmon, for whales. But what is this economic value? I mean, we're, right. the world is starving for fish oil now. We can't, yeah. you know, and, and so. And, and they were a big part of First Nations culture as a well. Huge part, yeah. well, mm -hmm. you, you can imagine, right? Yeah. I mean, your, your winter fat, your, your yeah. oil, and fat is what our brains are made of and everything else. So. You know, that, those are gone. Uh, we've lost some other things. But, you know, to the extent that we can stop that thinking and that trend and those practices, nature will 
rebound. You know, we're not going to get a million. I mean, there's some things we've just lost. Yeah. We've lost them. It's you know, it's, yeah. it's tragic. Yeah. Uh, however, the, that's, that's done. The question is now, are we going to keep doing that? You know, are we right. going to keep putting the, the singular and the cumulative pressure on these species and these habitats uh, so that they get blink out? Mm -hmm. You know, or are we going to figure out ways to, you know, continue to 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 have a, a quality of life that we enjoy, to see yeah. economic development, etc. But doing that in harmony with and reconciled with these species, and that that is absolutely the the you know the fundamental challenge of this century for humans. We're, we're I had an interesting conversation with Ross Beatty, who mm -hmm. you know yeah. well, is, Ross is a great, you know, good, like uh, Rudy, uh, uh, fantastic uh, yeah. supporter of. Uh, yeah. just so devoted to the environment. Yeah. And he says, and I know that sounds odd considering that I make my living yeah. in the mining sector. Yeah. He said, but you know, we live at that cross section between modern living and needing to be able to be as environmentally aware of what the impact of that is yeah. uh, as we move forward. And so every decision that we make has to say, yeah, well, I want to move forward and protect uh, our way of life, yeah. but at the same time, I want to protect the environment in which we're enjoying that yeah, life. Yeah, and we can do that. You know, my thing is like solution-oriented, right? I enjoy science, I enjoy understanding things, but I, I, I want to, you know, solve problems. Yeah. Well, you know, when you put pilings down or, or you build something, there is no reason why that has to be a net negative impact. You can, you can build them and design them so that they create fish habitat. Well, we've demonstrated that we have the ability to muster up the intellectual capabilities that are needed or requirements that are needed to face virtually every challenge that we're presented with. And, and so by being aware of what's happening in our local environments, yeah. so close to a major uh, urban development, I applaud you for what you're doing and for reminding us how important it is. Yeah. Thank you very much for coming. Thanks, doing Stuart. This. I appreciate yeah. it. Yeah, you can yeah. see the report at oceanwatch.ca. I think the coolest thing, I know we're out of time, the coolest thing is the action plan that we put in there. Yeah. The community forum of local governments, First Nations have picked that up. They've put in place a task force and they're, they're going for it. They're saying, yeah, we want to we really do something about this.